All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Amanda, and I am one of the co-owners of San Diego Family Mediation Center, as well as California Family Mediation Center in Orange County. Um, and I, uh, I'm a professional family mediator, so work with couples um, mainly who are going through divorce, um, who want to stay out of court, uh, and we work with them throughout the whole process from mediation, from co-parenting to division of assets and debts to support. Um, and today we're going to be talking about um, how to thrive as a co-parent. And I have a wonderful guest with me today. I have Cindy Grossman here with me from Kids Turn San Diego. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Cindy and let Cindy introduce herself um, and a little bit about what Kids, Kids Turn does. Hi, everyone. I'm Cindy Grossman, the executive director of Kids Turn San Diego. And uh, personally, I have a license in clinical social work. I've been with Kids Turn for seven and a half years now. And um, what we do is we really um, exist to help children be happier. We work with children and families experiencing separation, divorce, and military transitions. And it's our job to help parents um, get along better, gain some insight into words, actions, and behaviors, and to help the children be able to share their thoughts and feelings with others, um, especially with their parents when they're able to, and really to change a family dynamic so kids are free to focus on being a kid and not have to worry about adult worries. So thank you yeah. for having me, Amanda. Of course. And um, Kids Turn is a wonderful organization. We've had a lot of clients who have participated in the workshops and, you know, has really, really helpful for the children and, and also the parents. Right. Because I know that, you know, you guys are there to provide um, for both. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about your co-parenting classes is that most of the co-parenting classes that are available um, don't... Uh, don't, don't have a piece for the for the children, right? And I think that that's really important um, for you guys to have. So um, one of the things we've been kind of starting off with on our webinars recently, uh, as we've been doing these through this time, is just talking a little bit about um, where the courts are at. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, kind of just a little bit of an update um, that, you know, we as we've discussed, the courts reopened or kind of resumed some services about two weeks ago. Um, and, you know, they are, however, of course, still is going to be very backed up. I know that they're setting hearings out, um, and I think they're starting to do some more hearings soon. Um, in terms of filing documents, we're finding that some things are coming back very quickly, and other ones are taking a lot longer. So even to start new cases, we're finding that it's taking, you know, taking some time. Um, so, I, you know, definitely mediation is still, an, still, still a great option to be able to, to stay out of court. You know, those hearings may take even longer than we're anticipating. We're not really sure. Um, and, you know, that, that'll that be interesting. Um, so, C Cindy, with that, you know, during this time, I think you had shared with, shared with us that you guys have moved um, your workshops and stuff online. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you guys are doing at this time and how, how that's worked? Of course, of course. And let me first start with, because you did say that we're a different kind of program. So with our family workshops for separated and divorced families, we are a different organization or program actually than others in that it's a whole family co-parenting program. So the way that it works is both of the parents attend when they're able to, along with children ages five to 17. And when we're in our regular in-person classes, basically just to give you a snapshot of the program, uh, everybody joins in a large orientation room. We do orientation. You get to meet the group leaders of the three children's groups. They're broken up by ages five to seven, eight to 11, and then 12 and older. And then mm -hmm. all the kids then leave the room with their groups. Um, on average, there's about anywhere from I would say maybe 10 to 15 children in any group at any given time. Um, the children are not required, this is a common question, the children are not required to attend every week um, because mm -hmm. we do understand that sometimes they're with one parent or the other parent or they have soccer or baseball or what have you. Um, so we do ask the children to attend as many classes as able. 73% uh, of the children actually attend all four classes. 
Um, okay. And then both, oftentimes, both of the co-parents will attend together. And I do want to say that the program is most effective when both parents and children are in attendance. However, yeah. um, it is not a requirement. So um, going back to that first day, then once you meet the children's groups and the kids go into their classrooms, we speak to the parents for a few more minutes, and then you're separated into different classrooms. So common question is, do I have to be in the same classroom as my co-parent? Absolutely not, never. Um, you are not in the same classroom. And then, however, everybody is learning the same skills in our program, but at their own developmental level. So your five-year-old is learning the same communication strategies as you are as a parent, but in a way that a five-year-old can understand that mm -hmm. And so we transitioned mid-March uh, when the stay at order got implemented. We were in the middle of our March program and the families that were in attendance were amazing. They rolled with it with us. We moved <laughs> immediately to a virtual model. Um, and since then, uh, we keep fine tuning because we're thinking this is gonna be our new normal probably. Um, mm -hmm. At this time, we're actually in the middle of our June class, which by the way is our 300th workshop in the history of our organization. Wow, that's pretty cool. amazing. Pretty cool. Yeah, we yeah. just celebrated 24 years of service last week. Wow, congrats. That's wonderful. So thank, you. thank you. So in the virtual model, the way that that works is uh, you're attending from your home. Both co-parents typically are attending with the virtual models we're finding. Um, we're sending you a link and we're doing a live Zoom telehealth sessions with both parents and teenagers um, during the normal schedule of the program. And then for the uh, five to 11 year old children, they're actually hopping on the program after the parent classes and teen classes end because we understand they need help, first of all, to get on a computer probably. Yeah. Um, and families may not have extra computers for all those, you know, family members to be on. So yeah. the five to 11 year olds come on at the end. And for this program um, in July, the five to 11 year olds are participating in three live Zoom classes. And then we also send videos home for them to watch as well. So they're getting the nine hour program, just like the parents mm -hmm. and the that's great. Um, so that is, yeah, what some of you may not know, but part of our program is a family law judge attends the last week usually and meets with the children's group. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that is to demystify the court process and, and the judge um, to give the kids an opportunity to see what the judge looks like or, you know, to ask questions. And, yeah. It's not uh, typically the judge in the family's case is not the judge that's visiting our program. Um, but in the virtual model, it was really cool. Last month, we actually had a judge visit with the teens mm -hmm. and then answer the questions um, of younger children we've had. This month, the younger children will actually be asking the questions and the, we'll ask the judge to respond, and then we'll provide the answers via video by the two group leaders of those age groups um, so that they're actually hearing the responses as well. Yeah, yeah. It is a court-approved co-parenting program, so sometimes families are court-ordered, not always. Mm -hmm. Many come voluntarily, many come at the mediation level. Mm -hmm. um, it is a good program. We have been told by parents, if you're early in the process, um, to come to our program because it sets the stage for ways to communicate and figure out what's in the best interest of your children yeah. without going through the entire court process first. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we've had parents newly separated all the way up to 15 mm -hmm. years divorce. So it's a continuum. And, Parents tell us that that they learn new things and um, 
92% of the parents tell us that they're having better relationships with their children as a result of mm -hmm. our program. Yep. And 87% of the parents say that they are having better co-parenting communication. That's great. So yeah, so, it's available for people. Yeah, that's wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about um, co-parenting and, you know, wondering, you know, we're seeing, you see so many parents, you know, and children and, and families that are co-parenting. Um, and what, what would you kind of, if you could give like a, a you know, two or three kind of top tips um, for co-parents, what would, what would some of those be? Well, let's see, I would say under the current community health challenges mm -hmm. that we're having of the coronavirus and people, some parents being essential workers and other parents working from home and others who have lost their job. Um, couple tips around that. One would be this, cause this mm -hmm. is what we hear a lot is, we hear I'm upset because my um, co-parent is not protecting our children or mm -hmm. I don't want to have my kids go to their other parents' house because they're an essential worker. And so what we try and tell parents is this, is that your children have the right to see and love both of their parents, no matter what, they have that right. Mm -hmm. And even though you're no longer together, um, it's important for your children that you support that relationship with their other parent. And you may be afraid that they're going to be exposed. Um, however, that said, your fears are very valid. However, you have no power and control over what happens in the other house, whether it's around coronavirus or it's around fast food or it's around bedtime. Mm -hmm. You just have no control. Um, and if you can figure out or accept that really, and figure out what you're really worried about or concerned about, do something for yourself. So like, for example, with the coronavirus, we had quite a few parents saying that they were worried, you know, that their co-parent was allowing their kids to be exposed to other people, mm -hmm. um, you know, going to birthday parties or what have you. And really what we do is, kind of help you through some of the skills of that, of thinking about what is the real problem because you have no control over what your co-parent is gonna expose your children to. So what you do have control over is how you manage it for yourself, right? So yep. we talk with parents about what strategies can you implement to get yourself to feel better. So like, for example, when your kids come home, you can say, okay, you know, we're gonna wash your clothes right away. You know, they're going to go right into the laundry or, you know, um, this is what we're going to do in our house to make sure that we're all safe. The minute we walk in the door, everybody washes their hands. You know, maybe we sing happy birthday twice while we wash our hands, which is the recommendation. Um, we encourage them to decide what um, steps instead of trying to run to court and Maybe that's not the best way. In, instead of trying to engage the court to solve this problem, figure out how you can do it yourself. So like if you're on Talking Parents or any other communication tool or you're just emailing, send a message to your co-parent. I'm worried that our children are being exposed. You may not hear anything back and accept that you might not, but mm -hmm. you asserted what your fears are. You shared your yeah. thoughts and feelings with your co-parent. And you took control over that. You can't control what they do or say, right? So it's, I guess mm -hmm. the tip would be, it's really hard in a divorced family to accept that you no longer have any control of what happens when your children are in their other house. It's hard, hardest thing, right? But really is trying to figure out for yourself a way to manage your own fears, anxieties, worries, so that when your kids come home, and here comes tip number two. Tip number two is when your children come home, know that there's a transition period. Every single child goes through it and it looks different for every kiddo. So, and what we describe that as, as some kids need to run to their bedroom and they need to shut the door and they just need to kind of be there. Other kids wanna hop in front of the TV or hop on video games. 
other children want to come running to you and give you hugs and kisses and tell you about the best thing that they did. So it really varies. Um, and Amanda, for some kids, it's 10 minutes. And for mm-hmm. some kids, it's 24 hours. Um, the older the children, sometimes the longer it takes for them to transition. Yeah. And tip number three is that oftentimes parents who are divorced will interpret that behavior as they don't like something at the other parent's house. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a perception of, oh, my goodness, my child is running to their bedroom and not talking to me for the entire day. Something's not right at the co-parent's house. Something bad is happening. And that's tip number three is please don't believe that. It's important for your own health and well-being that you not allow your thoughts and and mind to spiral in that Mm -hmm. way because it's really your kids just need time to transition and transition is normal and healthy for them. Yeah. So those are really my top three. (laughs) Yeah. I think those are great tips. So now I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we see in mediation with parents on, on, on that end. Um, you know, I, I think your first tip about, you know, how you like you can't control what goes on in the other person's house, right? And I think that with that, one of the things I always talk about with people too is you can't control how they react, but you can control how you react to something, right? right? And you can control the kind of the power you still let them have over you. And so I think that sometimes being able to decide how, you know, have the ability to decide how you're going to react to your co-parent can be very empowering that even if you can't change what's going on, you change how you react around it. And that makes things oftentimes a lot easier to kind of work with, right? So I think that... That's a big one. I think it's hard though. I hear, you know, a lot of times the stuff people argue about in mediation or in court is about control. And whether it's because one person maybe had more control during the marriage and that's shifting now, or because, you know, just somehow they want to control something that's going on. And we have that conversation a lot in mediation that you don't have that anymore. You can't. And 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 it's focusing on, you know, the kids and focusing on what's best for them and how you can help the kids, not the control piece of it, you know, that's there. Right. Um, so that I think is really, you know, really important um, to think about. Yeah. And a really good example, Amanda, common that we hear is when we were married, we agreed that our children would eat healthy and not fast food. Mm -hmm. And now there's a separation or a divorce. And one of the parents is feeding their kids McDonald's in and out, whatever. Right. Like they just visit fast food or they eat out at various restaurants. And the co-parent who's at home, who's still following through with healthy nutrition and meals gets very upset that Mm -hmm. the other parent is doing fast food. And it's a, it's a conversation of you have no control Mm -hmm. over what your other, the other parent is feeding your children. You have no control, but what do you have control over? Well, one is you can control how you react or respond to that. Mm -hmm. Right. So we, Oftentimes parents will tell us, because I'll say, I run our advanced classes, our continue the conversation class. And this comes up a lot. It's an advanced two hour refresher class. And parents will say, well, as soon as my kids walk in the door, I ask, what did you eat? What did you do? How was your visit? And so (laughs) my strategy and tip around that is stop. Mm -hmm. Like it's really none of your business what your kids did with their other parent. That's their time. Right. So Mm -hmm. instead of asking your kids, what did you eat and what did you do? You can say something more like, tell me about the most fun thing of your weekend or the time. Or Mm -hmm. you can stay away from that altogether and say something like, hey, what did I miss at school? Uh, Right. mm -hmm. Or, Hey, how was I know you had a soccer game on Wednesday night. How did that go? Yes. So focus on your relationship with the children and stop worrying about what the other parent did, because here's the part of control. You have no control over it. Mm-hmm. And like you just said, you can control what you think and what you feel. So yeah. why do you have to keep setting yourself up for being upset? 
yep. right? That's a, it, if yeah, you're it's there and doing fast food, you know yeah. it's not going to change. So why yeah. do you keep asking about it? And and the other thing that I'll say about fast food is so what? When the kids yeah. are with you, feed them healthy. So yeah. half their, you know, half the time they're going to be eating good, nutritious, and the other half they'll be eating other food, whatever that may be. And it's all okay. Mm -hmm. Control yeah. what you have the ability to control and stop setting yourself up to be upset. Like yep. that, I think, is what parents oftentimes don't realize that they're setting themselves up because of the questions that they're asking their children. Yeah. I think that's a very, yeah, it's a very good point. Um, and I think, you know, kind of looking at it from, you know, kind of the legal point of view in that these sometimes are things that people try to bring to court, right? Try to bring to a judge of like, I want to, I want to, you know, he can't, he or she can't be feeding them that way. I've got it. And the thing is, is, you know, as much as you may feel that that's not keeping them safe, it's, there's a, it's a very kind of high, you know, threshold of when you look at safety with children, right? And, you know, unless there's, you know, a documented health concern from a doctor that has said, you know, there's certain things that they shouldn't be eating or can't, a court isn't going to get. Involved. Mm -hmm. I see what I hear. Other times, sorry if my sound went out for a second there. Um, other times, what I hear is, um, uh, sorry, my microphone issues. Um, other times, um, the idea that, uh, oh, it, it's it, that's what they're able to do, right? You know, not everybody can cook healthy meals and can, can do the same stuff that the other parent can. And it's not necessarily about, you know, wanting to feed the kids bad food if the other parent looks at it that way, but it's about what they're able to do. And that's, I think, important to remember too. Everyone has a different capacity. That's right. And it, it all goes back to be the best parent you can be when your kids are with you and also be the best parent you can be when with their, when they're with your, their other parent. And, yeah. and sometimes parents have a hard time grasping what that means. They get it. How do I be the best parent when my kids are with me? They get that. Mm -hmm. But how do you be the best parent when your kids are with their other parent? Well, you need to respect the time, right? You don't need to know about everything that they did. It, it's unnecessary. You know, even if like you reflect back when you were married, you didn't have every minute of every day of your spouse and what they did with your children, you didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. Like that's normal, right? Like sometimes yeah. a, a dad will take their kids out, you know, when it's a um, an intact family and they go out and they're gone all day and they come home and they may or may not tell the mom what they did. Like that's mm -hmm. normal. And the mom would never question, right? Yeah. Because there's a sense of safety and trust and, Oh, isn't that so great that dad went out with the kids? But somehow when parents get divorced, there's that that sense of trust gets broken or forgotten, perhaps. Um, and you want to start questioning a lot more. Um, yeah. We really encourage parents to. And, and going back to that, what does that mean to be the best parent that you can be when your kids are not with you? So that means take care of yourself. Don't sit at home and say, oh, my goodness, I have to wait until seven o'clock because that's the time I get to talk to my children. So I nope, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to sit at home all day today and wait until seven o'clock. No, <laughs> if you get invited out to go have coffee with a friend, go and have coffee with a friend. Like give yourself the freedom to when your kids are not with you. It's OK. You are allowed to be a human being and an adult whose kids are with their other parents. It's perfectly okay. And just make sure it's seven o'clock, you're near a phone, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to make that call. The other thing too, is that it's important that if your children, and this comes up a lot, Amanda, you probably hear it in mediation too, but if your children are with you and they wanna call their other parent or they wanna FaceTime or mm -hmm. Skype or whatever, 
I don't understand sometimes why it is that parents say no. Mm -hmm. And I do understand it. It's because sometimes it's not in the court order. Sometimes the court order says seven o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes parents want to, it's a matter of control. No, this is my time. You're not doing that on my time. But here's the thing for anybody who's listening. It's damaging to your children when they don't have access and they want to have access to their other parent and damaging in that, not like they're going to do anything or it's going to break their heart, but it's the message that you're giving to them is that their other parent is not important, that the relationship with the other parent is not important. And if parents would just decide if our six-year-old wants to call daddy because they just got an award at school and daddy was at work, The six-year-old should be able to call daddy in the car and say, oh my gosh, I just got an award. Mm -hmm. Or if, you know, if the time to talk to to mommy is four o'clock in the afternoon, but it's bedtime and I'm having a hard time going to sleep and, you know, I say, can I call my mommy? Well, yeah, the answer should be yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Because if, if the child wants to talk to the other parent, now, of course you have to manage that, right? Mm-hmm. So if the child wants to call the other parent as you're sitting down to dinner or as you're running out the door to go out to dinner or whatever you're doing, no, you know, you can't stop and change everything so your child can call their other parent. But you would say, you know what, we're running out the door right now or we're having dinner. How about if we make that call after dinner? Yeah, that's no, very we're important. Ordered today. And then remember to follow up and and have your children make the call. They're not wanting to call their, you know, in some situations maybe, but nine out of 10 kids are wanting to call their other parent because they miss them. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. (laughs) There's not much more around it. Or, you know, if it's a teenager, it's maybe because they left something at their other house that they need for school. Mm -hmm. It's not because they don't want to be with you. Yeah. It's not right. It's it tends to more be nine out of 10. It's more because they just want to connect with the other parent. And I think as a co-parent, if you can see it from the eyes of your children, then you can let go of that and have less control over it. Because if all your kid needs to do is talk to their other parent and say good night. Well, then the rest yeah. of your bedtime routine is going to be great. Yeah. What we that's one of the things we talk about when we discuss our parenting plan and mediation is is phone calls and communication. And mm-hmm. you know, our, our default, unless there's a reason not to, is to say that anytime a child asks to call or communicate with the other parent, that they're always allowed to. And mm-hmm. like you said, there may be times where it needs to be later, right? Yeah. Um, but it's it's always doing that. And one of the things we'll talk about too then is okay, you know, as the other parent, do you just call automatically at that time? You know, you do call them or does the other parent want like a text first to say, hey, you know, right. so-and-so wants to speak with you. Are you available? Right. Because I think that comes up right. too of kind of the, yeah. oh gosh, what if I am out? And you should be, right? Doing something when you're, you yeah. know, you're, for you when your kids aren't there. Um, but sometimes the other parent wants kind of a heads up so that they can get into, get to a place where they can talk or FaceTime, because I think a lot more, especially with young kids, right, we use FaceTime or Skype um, so that they can see, you know, so you can see them. So mm-hmm. it's all about kind of the communication, too, around how you're going to do that. Um, and, you know, so we talk about it both as if the kid wants to initiate co- communication and if the parent wants to, right, because they're different things. And I think that, you know, oftentimes it'll be a set time for the parent to call, but if the kid asks, it should be like, right. So that conversation of what it what it looks like, I think, is important. Um, and Cindy, I really liked what you were talking about about be the best parent you can be when your kids aren't with you. I think that that's great, just because you know I'm going to use that with clients because we talk about, of course, being the best parent you can be with your kids, but that there's more to that. And you know, when they're not with you, that there is so much that goes on. And, and you know, to, to go to some of the things that you just that you talk about, the idea that um, you know you don't want the kids to ever feel like they have to hide something from you from, from what goes on at the other parents, right? And I think that's really important because 
you know, the whole idea of control and the whole idea that you may not agree of everything that's going on at your co-parent's house with the kids, but the kids should never realize that, right? right. Because otherwise they will feel that they need to hide things from you. Yes. And, you know, they learn that, unfortunately, they learn that really young, right? Because they yeah. see your reaction and they know that, oh gosh, you know, mommy or daddy doesn't like what's going on at, at mommy or daddy's house, right? So that they... They do, and that's that's something that I think we always talk about is really important is thinking about your reaction, um, and it's it's not just your verbal reaction, right? It's your nonverbal because you know kids can see and understand that, and you know if you can put aside your feelings and put aside what your kind of control and thoughts are, that's what's important, you know, for the kids um, yeah. for sure. Um, and I wanted to talk about kind of one of the last tips you had brought up about transitions, because I think that's a really good um, topic to talk about. Um, and I think is something that, uh, you know, especially with everything going on right now, people may have changed some of their schedules, right? Mm -hmm. Kids are home, you know, full time. And I know most schools are finishing up now, but we're getting into summer and mm -hmm. not all the camps are opening, right? I think very few are. And so kids are going to be home more and so that's requiring some modification to schedules which may also mean there's more transitions sometimes right, right? and so yes. i think it's important to understand how do your kids react to transitions um that's one of the things we talk about when we set like a regular schedule because you know if a, if a child needs more time for transitions right like if it is that kind of it takes a day to kind of get back into the mix. Well, then you're not going to want to have a schedule where the kids are going back and forth every two or three days, right? right? And yeah. so, you know, especially I know sometimes people do a different schedule in the summer. Maybe they're going to do like a, a full week with each parent, mm -hmm. whereas during the school year, they don't do that. Um, right. And I think that that's something to, you know, important to talk about now, especially now. Um, and making sure, like, how do you guys make your schedules work for you and for the kids with everything that's going on? Yeah. And, you know, one of the values of coming to our family workshop program is that parents learn some strategies and techniques that could help them have those conversations together without having to... Um, engage professionals, mediators, the court. Not that we don't want them to do that, but especially at a time right now, the courts are so, we're hearing, and even you said they just are opening, um, there's going to be a huge backlog. And if you need to go to court to talk about your summer plans, well, by the time you get there, it's probably going to be December, right? Or yeah. you know, so yeah. later in the year. So um, really, whether you come to our program or any other co-parenting program, it's really about a couple things. One, learning how to respond instead of react mm -hmm. to your children and your co-parent, because there's a difference and I can talk about those if you want. And the other part of it too is figuring out how you can communicate with each other um, without emotion. Hmm. Without okay, emotion. Do you want to talk a, talk a little more about that? I think that that's something that people have a tough time with. It's a really hard thing to do because when you're married, there's an emotional connection. When you're divorced, there's an emotional connection. And I think for for folks when they get divorced, one of the hardest things to let go of is that emotional piece. Mm -hmm. And so we use a phrase communicate in a business-like fashion like in co-parenting oftentimes that's kind of a common terminology um, but really and people say well what does that mean how do i do that well mm -hmm. communicating without emotion means um, that before you open your mouth right you're maybe writing it down or before you send that text you're mm -hmm. typing it and you're walking away from it and then you're coming back to it later. When you do that, nine out of 10 times, maybe even 10 out of 10, to be honest, you're retyping or re, you know, removing words mm -hmm. out of your text or out of your email um, because a lot of the words that you will see are full of emotion. Mm -hmm. So like you'll see things like, I'm worried that our kids are gonna be with you because you're an essential worker and I don't know what you're doing when you get home from work and you're exposed to the coronavirus every day. And 
it's not fair that you subject our children to this and they're my kids too and I'm keeping them safe while they're with me and when they're with you, they're not safe because you're an essential worker and you're exposing them every time they're with you, right? That's kind of a common thing right now. So yeah. if you step away from that and you instead communicate that without emotion, it might look more like, hey, I know you're an essential worker. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our community. I'm wondering, how are you keeping our kids safe when they're with you? Send. Yeah. You see the difference? Um, the response from that parent on the other end, you can imagine between those two options, is going to be very different. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's what we're saying when that's an example of communicating without emotion. It's like really looking, you need to take care of your own emotions, right? So whether you have a therapist, a friend, a colleague, your parents, whatever, a journal that you keep for yourself, your emotions are very important and it's good that you own them. But when you're divorced and you have a co-parent, co-parent is not an ex-spouse. An ex-spouse is somebody that you had a relationship with, whatever that looked like, right? And you had some type of connection and emotional connection to that individual. When you're divorced, yes, you are an ex-spouse, which means that you have to have, figure out a way how to disconnect from that relationship together. And part of that disconnection is if you can transition to being a co-parent then it means that you no longer have to worry about the ex-spouse part, right? Divorce means that I am no longer having any power control or connection with the spouse part. They're now off to do their own thing and I am off to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. The connection that keeps us together is our children. And I think that, that oftentimes in our programs, we see that parents who are divorced 10, 15 years and coming to our program and have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in court hearings and attorney fees and trying to figure this out, it's like they're stuck at that, this is still my spouse. Mm. And I want to control or have some type of an emotional connection with that spouse mm -hmm. you know I paid to get divorced like they're still connected yeah. at that level <laughs> and part of the strategy then for them is to take some ownership that that's happening for them mm -hmm. and then to figure out for yourself outside of our program really because um, oftentimes that requires a lot of soul searching and accepting on your part of what you think and how you feel about that relationship but putting that aside for a minute, stepping into our new relationship is as co-parents to our children. And what does that look like? Yeah. And if we're going to be the best parents that we could be, let's face it, there's no handbook for parenting. <laughs> you know, there's not, no, when we get a driver's license, we have to take a test and we have to renew it every few years, right? But for parenting, there's nothing. Right. We're, we're parents like we were raised and hopefully we're doing, you know, an equally good job, if not better, if if our own parenting to us wasn't so great that we're able to do a little bit better for our own kids. Um, but there's no manual. And so when you look at co-parenting as a if you look at it as a strategy of raising these human beings that we created together so that they're the best human beings they can possibly be, right? Then parents have to get rid of their own emotion and they have to say, okay, well, our kid is a baseball player. So we're both gonna go to every single game. It doesn't mean they have to sit together. It doesn't mean they even have to sit on the same side. You know, like you could decide, well, I'm always going to sit on the visitor side and you always sit on the home team side, whether we're at a home game or a visitor's game, then we don't have to sit near each other. You sit at third base and I'll sit at first base, you know, yeah. and you don't have to sit together, but being there for your child is what's most important. 
Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. I think that one of the um, one of the kind of term phrases I've heard too is the idea of you know loving your children more than you hate your or may hate your ex spouse or your co parent, right? And so it doesn't. I think that goes along exactly with what you're saying because it's not about your feelings for them as your you know ex spouse. It's about loving your kids and that's the important part. And I think, you know, you bring up something about like a baseball game and things like that is that it's oh, it's only about the kids, right? It should never be about you and your, and your co-parents. It is about the fact that the kids want you there. And, you know, it's important that they see, even if you're not together anymore, that they see that both of their parents still get to be at their baseball game, right? Because, you know, why does their friends get, get, have both of their parents there, but they can't. Right. And so I think that that's, you know, it's, it's very important to, you know, be aware of, of, of what, what's important to the kids. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, here's another example, Amanda, that when children are involved in things also that a tip for co-parenting is not to assume that the other parent is going to align with the activity. So mm -hmm. for example, we had a, a seven-year-old little girl once in our program, and she had been in a weekday camp. You know, it was a week camp, and it was a theater camp. And at the end of the camp, there was a show, and the show was on um, Saturday afternoon. The only reason I know about this is because the family was in our program on the last day of, of this camp for the show. And the mom was very upset because the dad would not let their daughter be in the theater show at the end of camp. Mm -hmm. And she was very upset. The kid came into the program. She was crying. I guess like they found out right as they were coming in that dad was not going to allow this little girl to be in the show. Mm -hmm. So um, mom had to do like a lot of work with the camp and tell the camp she can't come. The kid let down all of her friends. The kid was very upset. Well, in the end, what we learned as to what happened was, so the daughter was with them with one parent who signed her up for the camp mm -hmm. and went to the camp. But on Saturday, the, say, the day of that show, that was the transition day where the daughter was with dad. Mm -hmm. And dad's time started, he would normally pick up the daughter at 9 a.m. Well, the show was at four. Mm -hmm. So the mom never communicated throughout the week at all to dad to say, hey, by the way, I have our daughter in this camp and the show is Saturday at four o'clock. What do you think? She never did that. Assumed, assumed that she would tell the dad on Saturday and it would be okay because the daughter wanted to be in the show. So it was really a setup to everybody. Um, that could have been resolved very easily by mom communicating to the dad, hey, by the way, I have our daughter in a theater camp and the show is Saturday at four o'clock. Can yeah. she be in it? Or I know that's your time. What do you think? Yep. Right? That, yeah. But so that's just like a, a good example of Sometimes we think we have all the control over our kids and we want to control their time with the other parent too. And you always can't do that. Sometimes you have to put it out there and communicate to the other parent what you're doing in a business-like non-emotional manner. You know, like if it had the mom send an email to the dad, oh my goodness, I got our kid into this great, amazing camp and it's the most wonderful thing in the world and she's going to be in this theater show and you have to let her participate. It's Friday at four o'clock and it's your time, but it's the most important thing in the world, right? The dad might've been like, yeah, no, not that important, right? Yeah. But if the text might've been, hey, I enrolled our daughter in this camp and the show's Friday at four, I know that's your time. The commitment is this, what do you think? Mm -hmm. There might've been a different outcome. So yeah. that's like one scenario. And then the scenario, of course, that I talked about at the beginning of what played out of yeah. um, one parent not having any communication and just assuming that that yeah. the other parent was going to align with it just because she set it up. 
Yeah, and com yeah. communication is, I mean, that's a, a big thing in general, right? I mean, I think that I'm always talking with clients of that communication is just is so important. And mm -hmm. it, it's tough for some co-parents, right? It yeah. is, oh, yes. um, you know, so I don't know if maybe you can share a tip or two um, that you, you know, additional tips um, about how best to communicate. Um, mm -hmm. I know you've already talked about kind of, you know, the idea of using business, kind of business language instead of the emotional, um, but even even kind of just strategies around like, how do you improve the communication? Do you find that there's better ways for co-parents to communicate with each other in mm -hmm. other ways? Mm -hmm. So certainly coming to our program helps. Yep. <laughs> um, but beyond that, um, I can think of two things. One would be um, when you're sending a text message, an email, a talking parent, a family wizard, whatever it is, when you're gonna send it, don't send it right away. Write it out, walk away from it, and send it later. After you review it a second time to make sure that it's a non-emotional communication. Mm -hmm. So that would be one tip. The other would be, you know, one of the biggest challenges being in a divorce situation is that one, you want to have control and you don't. Mm -hmm. And two is that no matter what the other parent does, a lot of times you're going to find fault in it or something wrong with it. Well, I have to be really honest. That's more about you than it is about the other parent. Mm -hmm. So as a way to improve communication would be really take a look at yourself and what you're doing to continue the conflict. Mm -hmm. Because when you're divorced, you made a decision no longer to be in that conflict relationship. You've made that decision no longer to, or maybe that decision was made for you, because we know it's not always both people. But nonetheless, you signed paperwork, mm -hmm. right? And that relationship is over. So that decision, however it was made, that decision to stay in connection is gone. The connection mm -hmm. is now about your children. And so if you can always think about how is this communication related to our children, not my children, but our children, mm -hmm. that's a strategy for communica improving communication. When you can step into these are our children, now you're co-parenting. Yeah. When you're stuck yeah. of these are my children, what are you doing with my children? Well, you don't own them. They're part of you and they're part of somebody else, <laughs> whether yeah. it's a biological connection or an adopted connection or a foster connection or grandma to adult child connection. It doesn't matter. They're not yours. Yeah. The, the, my, the my versus the ours is very interesting. Um, I see that a lot with clients in mediation and, and you can also see the reaction from the other person when you say my children, right? And I think that just just have using the term, saying our children, even if you're not happy with that other person, even if you're just at the very beginning stages of figuring out your parenting, it totally shifts the perspective on you know what that looks like. Um, and I realized I, for, I forgot to say earlier, but if anyone watching has questions, um, you can always put them into uh, the chat box and Cindy and I are happy to answer any questions um, that you guys might have. So sorry for not sharing that before, but um, feel free to we'd be happy to answer questions. Um, so, you know, yes, I think that that's, that's a, that shift is something that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we do have a question that came in. Um, so it says the other parent talks negatively about me when our child is over at their house. How do I address this? That is a great question. Indeed, it is a great, yeah, it is a really great question and more common, sadly, than we would like it to be. Um, but the way to address it is this way. Remember, you have no power and control. So you can't change it. Don't even address it with your other parent. When your children come home and they say, oh, you know, this is happening, just say to them, you know, some people talk nice about other people and some people don't. I don't know, but you have to make that up for yourself. But for you, you have to be the best human being you can be. 
So, you know, you know, like bullying is not something that you ever do with other children. So, you know, you kind of like take it into their world because you can't change it. But what you can do is you can teach your children how to manage that on their own. It becomes a life lesson. Mm -hmm. right? Um, when, when somebody else is what we say in our program is that when one parent is talking negatively about another parent, it's like shooting an arrow through your child's heart. Mm -hmm. And here's why, because oftentimes, for example, many children are told for a lot of years, you look just like this parent. You look just like your mom. You look just like your dad. Everybody says you look like your mom or you look like your dad. And now there's a divorce. Right. And now that other parent is saying things really bad about the other parent. Well, now your child begins to think, oh, my goodness, I everybody's been telling me ever forever that I look like this parent. Maybe I'm bad like that. Maybe I do bad yeah. things. So knowing that that is what might go through your children, the best way for you to address it is to just manage it with your children. And say things like, you know, yeah, that happens sometimes. You know, like you learned at school that you're not allowed to bully other children, right? Because bullying is hurtful. And I'm sorry that your other parent is saying bad things, but I want you to be the most kindest person in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you want to share with me what he's saying and ask or what she's saying and ask me questions, I'm open to listen. Because that's the other part. Sometimes as a parent, we get so frustrated and we get in my head, oh my goodness, what are they saying? Mm -hmm. That we miss the opportunity for when our children are coming to us and telling us that this is happening. It is an opportunity to engage your children in a conversation. Yeah. Not about, oh my goodness, what did they say? But more like, well, okay, so how did it make you feel and how can I help you? Yeah, I think that's very important. And, you know, one of the things uh, on our end on the mediation side is, you know, if you can, if you're not in this position yet, is having some of the conversations around guidelines around the kids on the, on the front end, right? So talking about things like this to hopefully just to prevent them. Um, yeah. So we had another great question that, that came in, um, and I know that you, you have, especially I think in your um, the advanced workshop, sometimes step parents, right? Mm -hmm. So um, asking about healthy step parent boundaries, if we can discuss mm -hmm. that. That's a really good question. So um, the first thing that I would just like to share that I say in, in our advanced class is that step parents have a bad rap because of Disney movies. Not to say anything <laughs> bad about Disney, but we've all watched Cinderella, you know, we've all watched those movies. And yeah. if we can shift out of what our perception is of a step parent and shift it instead to that these are bonus parents, it's a whole new perspective. Because here's the thing, when there are step parents involved, or let me say this first, it takes a village. Many of us have heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child, right? Our children go to school. Hopefully they'll go back to school in the fall or some, <laughs> right? <laughs> they have to learn from professionals who are skilled at teaching them. They have to have friends. They have to have some teachers that they're really going to like and others that they're not going to really like, right? They go to birthday parties and then they don't go to birthday parties. They play on softball or soccer or they dance, right? Kids have mm -hmm. influences, coaches, mentors, friends, parents of their friends. You know, a lot of kids love to go hang out at their friend's house because they love being there, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it takes a village. So if you can, if parents can step into, it takes a village. So, hmm. My co-parent is now with somebody else and just got married. So this is a bonus parent. This is somebody who's going to give my child some wisdom. You know, let's say they're 50-50 split. So my child is now going to be living in the home with their dad and bonus mom. So yes, of course, she's going to be the mom during that week. You have no control. Embrace it. Embrace that somebody else is going to be involved. When you're going to an award at your child's school and the step parent or the bonus parent wants to go 
Heck yeah. Because as a parent, that means that that step parent is embracing your child. And when your child is with them, they're being given all the love and caring that you would hope that your children would get. So how can that be bad? Right? I mean, you know, maybe some step parents are mean and not so great. That's a different story. But for the majority, step parents, when, when a parent takes on the role of marrying somebody who has children, they know what they're getting into. They know that they're going to be part of this divorce dynamic. They know that the kids are going to be there some days, but not all days. And I think as you look at step parent boundaries, if you can kind of think about that, these are people who know what they're, they're choosing. They've chosen, right, to marry your former spouse. Yeah. They're yeah. choosing to be a part of your children's lives. And if you fight against that, it's only going to cause you turmoil internally, and it's going to cause you to be upset. Yeah. But that's the yeah. choice that you're making, right? Like, you don't have to make that choice. You can say, all right, I'm going to embrace it. So what? Now there's a mom who's going to feed my kid well. Oh, hey, maybe they're not <laughs> having step parent or maybe not having fast food anymore. You know, because somebody yeah. else is going to cook a meal. It, yeah. I think it becomes about perspective. And the Definitely. you don't have to be best friends with the step parent. Nobody's saying that. Yeah. But if you like look at it as um, being able to just have the opportunity of stepping into it takes a village and the more in the village, the better we are. Yeah. Your kids are going to be better off. <laughs> it's so true. And I, I really like the term bonus parent because I think it also looks at it's not, you know, sometimes you we hear from parents about the idea of like, all right, you know, they're not replacing their, you know, it, the bonus gives that idea that it is someone else who cares. Um, so we only have a few more minutes, but maybe we can give real quick, um, kind of asking uh, as well, kind of boundary tips from the bonus parents point of view. So if there's anything that kind of they can do as well to make that easier, um, and then we'll wrap up for today. So I think the best tip that I can give for the bonus parent is this, is remember that that is your role. That it is your role to support your spouse in being the parent and the best co-parent that he or she can be for these children. And I think it's important when there's a bonus parent that you and your spouse take the time to talk about who's going to be doing the discipline who's going to be the rule setter. You want to have a united front, of course. But I would not recommend that the bonus parent be the one who's doing the disciplining because that sets you up for not being in a good place mm -hmm. with the children mm -hmm. and with the other parent and with the parent. So it's really better when you get into a, a bonus parent situation that there be a conversation between the two parents and an understanding, not a reporting too. like the bonus parent should not say, oh my goodness, you're not going to believe what your kids did today. No, because you have to have the authority in the moment to discipline and, and take care of your home. Like if, you know, if you have two kids and the older kid hits the younger kid and pulls their hair you're not going to sit back and go, oh, I'm not going to do anything. No, you're going to immediately intervene, right? Yeah. And you're going to immediately intervene. But then when dad comes home, part of that intervention may be, okay, we need to have a family meeting because we had a tough day today. Yeah. And you say yeah. to the older kid, okay, let's talk about what happened. What happened? And now everybody's sitting together in a family meeting and the older kid has to say, well, you know, she said this or he said this and I pulled his hair, or pulled her hair, you know, and they have to take responsibility for their behavior. Look at what we're teaching our kids. Right. We're teaching lifelong lessons of being yeah. accountable. And then maybe it was a little sister who was so annoying and wasn't letting her older brother do his schoolwork. Right. Yeah. And she could then apologize because she was doing behaviors that maybe weren't so great. 
So it gives that opportunity for communication. So I guess the best tip really is have conversations away from the kids as to who's going to be the parent who disciplines with contingencies of needing to take care of situations in the moment, but then ways that we bring that back to um, the biological parent. So it's not the bonus parent who's reporting and it's actually the children who are reporting. That's great. I think that's a great tip. Um, well, Cindy, thank you so much for joining me today. I think that was a great conversation. Um, we had some good questions and I think it was shared a lot of great information. Um, so, you know, we, we have up on the screen, you know, how people can find uh, Kids Turn Online. So kidsturnsd.org um, and all of your family workshops and, and information is, is online, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Um, and for us, um, you know, you can cross the bottom, you know, if you have any questions about mediation or anything, you can give us a call. Um, you can send us a message uh, through Facebook or um, our website as well as sdfmc.com. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining today. Um, you know, this will, this is, was recorded so people can access it uh, afterwards. And um, I appreciate all of the information that you shared. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for having us on your show. Thanks.